Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for uh, joining. My name is Lola Clayton. I'm a career advisor here at WGU. I appreciate your time and attention this evening. And my apologies for popping in about three minutes late. We had another workshop just uh, an hour before this one. And so just concluded that one and hopped in into this one. But our topic at hand this evening is overcoming job search obstacles. Have you ever asked yourself, why am I not getting interviews or why am I receiving the um, common rejection email? And maybe many of you are familiar with it. It goes a little something like, this. Thank you so much for applying, but we've decided to move on with other candidates. Anyone ever get that email? I'm raising my hand. I know I have. Has anyone else ever received that comment email before? Yep. Me as well, definitely. So thank you for that. A um, few things that I want to go over before we get started is um, I want to respect each and every one of you. So during this presentation, please, by all means, Take care of yourself. This is an informal uh, workshop, so move around, stretch. Um, just remain on mute if you can. If you need to step away or grab a drink of water, by all means, please find that you are um, very comfortable, and I want to just respect you and honor you at all times. So please make yourself comfortable throughout our time together within the next 40 to 50 minutes. If you have any questions outside of this presentation, feel free to send them over at our email address, which is careers.edu, careers at wgu.edu. Um, we will be more than happy to get your questions answered. I can answer them or any of the amazing qualified um, advisors that I work alongside each and every day are happy to assist you. We also offer what we call walk-in or same-day advising calls. And so you can call that phone number that you see anytime, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Mountain Time, leave a message and an advisor will return your call and can talk through with you one-on-one -on -one about your specific career outlook or your career questions. And keep in mind, this presentation is being recorded and available for public viewing, so a recording link will be sent to you by Friday of this week. Our agenda um, is very short, but packed packed with a lot of information to consider. So we'll talk about application considerations, meaning the applicant tracking system. A question for the greater good of the group. Has anyone worked in a recruiting role, maybe hiring, onboarding, um, bringing people into an organization? Just curious, may uh, lean into your experience if anyone has worked in a recruiting role. If you have, great, and you feel comfortable in putting that in the chat. If you haven't, no worries at all. Just always like to do a temperature check to see who is in the audience with some experience that maybe uh, can provide a testimony. And uh, just back in, okay, perfect, excellent. Sounds good. Temp agencies as well, if you have worked in, in um, anything that's in a, under that recruiting umbrella. Okay, no problem, no worries at all. Uh, the other question that I do have for the greater good of the group, has anyone connected with a career advisor uh, for maybe a one-on-one -on -one appointment or utilize any of our resources or services? Again, just a temperature check. If you have, great. If you have not, no worries. Just always like to ask to see once. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, excellent. Thank you so much for your engagement with that. So we'll talk about a few things. Again, application considerations. We'll talk about experience and skills gap. Now that second bullet point is going to be quote unquote crucial because when you are trying to conquer a job search obstacle, you really want to address the expectations that have been presented on a job posting. That is going to be very, very helpful. Um, in the previous workshop just before this one, one of the branding strategies that's recommended to anyone that is um, trying to overcome a job search is focus on your mindset of being, instead of a job seeker, a solutions provider. And so sometimes everything starts with our mindset and having a mindset shift. And so if you do that and you can create or see yourself as a solutions provider, then that will help you see this is what I need to do or this is the expectation on this job posting. What solutions can I contribute and can I bring to this role? How can I reflect that on my resume? And more importantly, how can I provide and showcase that during an interview? So those will be some rhetorical questions that you can ask yourself, but if you um, create that mindset and that approach, it'll be helpful in closing in some of those experience skills gaps. Yeah. And then
And then also we'll talk about networking. Networking is also equally as supportive. It is a great way to um, uncover that hidden job market. And sometimes that hidden job market can be not only what you know, but who you know. Um, and knowing and getting to know recruiters is going to be a great way to network. So a few things to think about application considerations and customization. The number one reason for not getting an interview when qualified for a role. So customization is going to be the uh, key word here. Has anyone ever, and I'm raising my hand, has anyone ever sent out their resume and use the same resume to apply for the same positions over and over again. If you feel comfortable in the chat and want, and, um, want to share that you have, great. Okay, I know, I definitely know I have before. I've used the same resume over and over again. But what we have come to realize is employers like to see a customized resume that's crafted around the expectations of the position that they have posted. And so I used an example just recently where, let's just say you have three job postings, they have all have the same title. I'm gonna say customer service agent for company A, B, and C. And so company A made the title is customer service agent, but maybe that job is to answer phones. You're answering phones and you are taking messages um, and maybe doing some dispatching. Company B, customer service agent, but perhaps you are working the front desk and you're not working on the phones. You are uh, resolving escalations or you are doing more um, exec, maybe executive administrative related roles. Company C, customer service agent, again, same job title, but maybe you're doing some payroll. Maybe you are doing um, going from site to site and connecting with executives and maybe filling in as a customer agent. So same, the, the point of the message here is same job title, three different companies, three different job responsibilities. So if you just send out that one resume and you have able to answer phones successfully and record messages, then you are eliminating yourself and not customizing your skill set to those other two positions. And so that's why companies really look for your resume to be customized to what is requested in that job posting. And most job postings are built to have a um, maybe preferred qualification section and um, or minimal expectations or what we need. So just different job postings are going to request it in different areas, but dissect the job posting as much as possible. Look at your resume, make sure your resume has a bullet that matches or addresses the expectations of that position. And that's where that cu customization is gonna be crucial. Applicant tracking systems are designed to scan for keywords from the job posting and assign a match rate. So in ATS, an applicant tracking system, there's very there's many different ones out here, GHR, PeopleSoft, Taleo. Sometimes if you go to apply for a position, you can even see the branding of the applicant tracking system that's being used. But that ATS is a filtering system that companies use for applicants for a position. So what you do when you go to apply for a position, you submit your application material, so, of course, your application, your resume, your cover letter, maybe letters of references, or even your um, academic transcript. So, whatever they are asking for, that ATS is going to be that first recipient of those documents. And what that ATS or that artificial intelligence software included in that applicant tracking system is built to do is scan for keywords and assign a match rate. And the higher the probability of the match rate, the higher the opportunity to advance your materials on to the next phase, maybe even the desk of the recruiter. The lower the match rate or the lower the keywords that are found in your application materials, the least the prob probability that your information will be advanced to the next slide, so, or to the next phase. So keep in mind, you want to have as many keywords from that job posting that you see repeated, splattered in an appropriate places throughout your resume. All right, application considerations. So how do you go about finding those keywords? Well, we touched on this just a bit. Start with the requirement and then the responsibility section of that job posting. And again, different job postings are designed different ways. Company A, B, and C, different companies, so a different style, right? So what you wanna do is look at the requirements. Um, most of us, and this is very common, so if you do this, I know, I know I've done this before and I know some have shared that when they get a job posting, they just kind of skim over, especially if it's a, a 
lengthy job posting, they skim over what the qualifications are. Maybe they look at the first the first one, the, um, a couple in the middle, and then the last one, and they're like, oh, I know how to do that. And then they look at the um, requirements for the position. Must have a bachelor's degree in business. Um, must, have, must have three years of experience. So they just kind of look and skim through and say, oh, I'm qualified for this position. I'm going to go ahead and send my resume. And that will potentially work. However, if you don't look through all of the bullets of the requirement or the expectations section, you may be missing some key words, again, going back, reflecting on our previous slide, some key words that are repeated through that job posting where the employer has requested what they need or they, what they're expecting from the employer. So start with that requirements and responsibilities section and ask yourself, what words do I see repeated? What phrases? Do I see that are repeated? Maybe even what tasks do I see that's repeated of this particular position? And have I mentioned that on my resume? Did I mention it, mention it in my professional skills summary? Did I mention it in my skills and qualifications section? Did I mention it in my summary of qualifications? Or have I embedded it in my employment entries for my previous employer? So make sure you have included those phrases and or keywords that you've seen repeated or you've seen requested on that job posting. Some great resources is JobScan. This is a software that is designed very similar to an applicant tracking system where you are able to um, upload your resume, sometimes even upload the job posting, and then see what type of percentage match rate will come out of that. So. What I'll do now is if I can copy this link here and post it in the chat for anyone that is interested in looking at job scan. So hopefully that works. Or you can also Google, job, if that link breaks, then you can also Google job scan. That's J-O-B-S-C-A-N, as you see here on the slide. Great resource to just see how well your resume is branding you and representing you towards a specific position. And of course, our last bullet here, again, a rhetorical statement. For each requirement, do you have a bullet point that addresses this? Have you put a bullet point that addresses the requirement and the expectation of that rule? Addition to that, templates and formatting. So the applicant tracking system or the ATS is notoriously bad at reading any formatting embellishments, any templates. One great thing about Microsoft Word, they do provide um, a template for you. Has anyone ever used the templates that Microsoft Word has created. Again, I know I have. I, I always ask these questions because these are things that I've done before as a job seeker. Yep, I've used the template before. Um, I know even one of my kids, when they apply for their very first job, they use one of the templates. But keep in mind that applicant tracking systems are not always designed to accept those templates. Sometimes the characters, the alignment of those templates can get into the way and become very complex for an applicant tracking system. So with that being said, we recommend that you use a clean Word document that ensures readability so that the applicant tracking system can fluently and with ease be able to scan and find those needed keywords that are aligned with that job posting. Sometimes columns, colors, borders, style elements, pictures, different uh, bullet point characters. Maybe you use a closed bullet point and then later on in your resume you decided to use maybe arrow bullet points. Sometimes too many characters can be uh, complex for an applicant tracking system. So just use a really clean Word document. Maintain consistency with your font. Maintain consistency also with your, um, your font size as well as with any bullets that you decide to use. Cover letters are often requested, and I have a question for the greater good of the group. Do you think, or what is your thoughts around submitting a cover letter for each position that you apply for? So should a cover letter be submitted for each position that you apply for? I'm just curious on the thoughts from the group. Okay, got to know. We got a couple notes here. No, okay. 
Depends on the position. All right, good one. Good one. Absolutely. So if you mention no, or it depends on the position, great response is a cover letter. If an employer is requesting a cover letter, they are going to place that in the application um, materials. So they will say, to apply for this position, you must submit an application, resume, cover letter, transcript. It's very, a cover letter is very similar to your academic transcript. If it's not requested, are you gonna send it? Probably not, right? Because the employer didn't ask for it. Or like a reference letter. If it's requested, will you, you'll probably submit it because it's asked for. But if it's not, if it's not requested, then you may not submit it. And so think of a cover letter as exactly the same way. It's not a required document for every position, but if an employer is requesting one, they're definitely looking for a cover letter to be submitted. So include only if required and it's optional. But ask yourself when you are customizing and completing your cover letter, why are you a good fit for this role? So that you can summarize maybe three to four bullet points as to why you're a good fit so that that can appetize be or attract and be a lawyer to what qualifications that you have. And then why is this role a good fit for you? So again, two rhetorical questions to think about, but can be included in your cover letter when you're customizing it and crafting it. So employers normally are looking for a few things in a cover letter. One, they're looking, where did you find this position? Were you referred? Because that gives you an opportunity to name drop an internal employee. Secondly, did you find it, maybe you met someone at a career fair? That's how you um, uncovered the position. Thirdly, maybe you applied on their website. Fourth, maybe you applied on Handshake. Um, Handshake is our premium resource tool that we use to connect employers and students. So maybe you attended an upcoming career event for an employer and you found the position there and you're submitting your application material. So why are you a good fit for this role? You can talk about, I found this position here. I was referred by um, A, B, and C. They referred me for this role. This role aligns with my academic journey as well as my career outlook and a professional passion that I've had for about 10 years. So in, use your introduction to state that and then go on to say, why you are a good fit. And again, you can highlight maybe some achievements from your uh, career or maybe some awards that you've acquired while in your academics, um, or maybe some things, again, externally that maybe you've done outside of even professionally, maybe personally, that you decided this is why this position is good for me, and especially if it's an education, because I want to be able to help others um, and, uh, and be able to identify and connect with their learning curve. So however you like to phrase that verbiage, but ask yourself these two questions when you are crafting your cover. And so for experience gaps, and we did talk, uh, touch on this a little bit in our agenda, some additional rhetorical questions to ask yourself. So are you struggling to address any qualifications listed in the position description? So remember we talked about that exercise of dissecting the requirements and the expectations of the role, looking at each bullet point, then you can say to yourself, if you meet greater than 50% of the listed qualifications, you're likely a strong candidate proceed to apply. Customization is going to be crucial and very helpful and supportive to highlight your qualifications. However, flip side is if you meet less than 50% of the qualifications and maybe missing a few of the requirements, then it may be a experience gap. And so that skills gap analysis is going to be a great exercise, and we're going to go into that. I did see a question in the chat that says, are cover letters subject to applicant tracking systems or related bots as well? Yes, they are. They are going to, um, a, a cover letter is going to also be part of your application considerations and your application mm -hmm. packet, including your resume. So everything that goes through that funnel to the applicant tracking system is going to be subject to being scanned for keywords or, or seeing what type of requirements and, or through that filtering process. So customizing your cover letter is going to be very helpful. And using when you ask yourself those two rhetorical questions we reference, being able to infuse keywords appropriately in your cover letter is, uh, and on your resume is going to be helpful. So in finalizing this particular slide, let's take a peek at the skills gap analysis. So the skills gap analysis asks 
activity goes a little something like this. So if you see at the top here, your step one, gather three to four job postings for a targeted role. So I'll reflect back on the example I shared or mentioned about um, a customer service agent. So three, three just different companies, three different skills needed, or three different job postings, same job title, right? So gather a three to four job descriptions for a specific role. For each shared qualification, ask yourself, do you meet it? So this is when you are looking through the expectations of the position. Do I meet it? Do I have a skill that I've referenced on my resume that speaks to this? If you did, how so? Have you written it in action task results format where you've been able to provide the reader to show what action you've take, taken, what the task was, and what result you brought to the company? So if you do meet it, how so? And have you written it in action task and result format? And what will you say on your resume? And then your third step is for significant or critical gaps, so anything that you're unable to meet, consider what steps you will take to be more competitive. So that's where this step of four comes in, this grid here. So perhaps on that job posting, the employer is asking for someone with advanced Excel skills. So perhaps you work with Excel, right? You may have a, um, a entry level knowledge, but this particular job posting is asking for you to have advanced Excel skills. So you've um, identified that this is a need of yours, so, so that's going to be your second column. Um, what is, what will you use Excel for or the advanced Excel skills for this particular position? So perhaps in looking at the qualifications for the role, maybe you need um, to use pivot tables. Maybe that's something that they are asking for for Excel, or maybe you'll be using formulas extensively. And so maybe, again, you have some entry-level knowledge where you're able to filter and sort on Excel, but using pivot tables, uh, summarizing, or even putting in data sets in Excel, maybe that's something that's new to you. So you can list that here, an example of what they're looking for. And then your action is, what action will you take to fill in that gap or to acquire that knowledge? Is that something that you're learning your degree? Do you have a course around that? Is it something that maybe um, you can take advantage of a secondary course, like maybe Coursera or Udemy um, or a LinkedIn Learning? So you want to think about what action item you can take. And again, this is just an example. So Excel is simply an example. But when you look at your job posting, this will be the exercise that you want to take if you're trying to fill in any, any uh, critical gaps. And then you want to identify opportunities to use Excel more. Maybe it is an opportunity for you to use Excel in your own personal budget or even your own personal organization, maybe helping out a friend, um, but maybe um, gaining a book that has some sort of um, special activities or a workbook that's going to help you um, increase your knowledge and fill in that gap. So, and it lists here LinkedIn Learning or maybe your current employer doesn't use Excel specifically on a day-to-day -day task, but maybe it is something that you can implement as a project for your day-to-day -day task so that you can increase your familiarity with it. So, these four steps are the skills gap analysis to help you identify any gaps that maybe you may need to fill in based off of the job posting that you've seen and you see a theme in the job posting of what is a critical need from the employer. So this is a great way to approach that. And perhaps you've looked through the job posting and you can identify and speak to each, every bullet point that's listed there. And if you are able to do that, that is amazing. That is great. Pat yourself on the back that you're able to do so. But if maybe there's one to two bullets that you're like, hmm, not quite sure of that, utilizing that skills gap analysis is going to be helpful. It's also ultimately going to be helpful for you because if you do apply and your resume is selected and you're advanced, to the interviewing process, you want to be, again, that solutions provider, right? So you've looked at that job posting and you want to talk about solutions that you're able to bring. And so during the interview, this is when those talking points are going to be very helpful to you. And if you've conducted a skills gap analysis, then you know where there is maybe an opportunity for you to speak highly or speak about, I have not actually um, used advanced Excel skills per se in my current position, but I'm very familiar with different formulas of Excel being self-taught. So you'll be able to provide some sort of solution based off of the need of that particular role. 
I'll pause there. That was um, a lot of information and content all at once. Are there any questions around the skills gap analysis and how it can be supportive in overcoming your job search? Question, what are your recommendations for those that are pivoting to different career? For example, I have experience in nursing, but I'm working towards education and cybersecurity, but um, not relevant mm -hmm. job experience. So great, that is a great question. And so if you are a career switcher or a career changer, a few things that I recommend. One, to um, start networking. Um, and one of the phrases that I always like to use is not necessarily what you know, but who you know. And so if you're able to network internally, let's just say maybe you're working in a hospital or an assisted living facility and there is a IT support that is in-house, great way for you to um, connect with that specialist and say, you know, I am learning about cybersecurity. Do you have any knowledge about cybersecurity? Are there any, um, do you utilize information security in your current role? So taking advantage of maybe networking, um, and that's just an example if you can network in-house within your current employer. But if not, utilize the WGU alumni LinkedIn tool. That's gonna be helpful to see what other WGU alumni um, have are working in a cybersecurity role, you can send a direct message to them, kind of chat and, and ask for some time. Can I just kind of ask about what your what your approach was like in graduating with your cybersecurity degree and how you ended up landed, landing a position? Um, what certifications do you do you recommend or that you found are helpful in your current um, climate and current environment? So networking is definitely going to be um, helpful for you. We're going to talk about networking. That's going to be our next topic at hand as we close, kind of close out this um, this workshop here. So if you are career switching or career pivoting, showing your commitment to the industry of choice is going to be helpful. The third thing that I was going to add to that is a skills-based resume. Has anyone ever heard of a skills-based resume before? Yes, okay, wonderful. No, okay, perfect. Got a little mixed reviews there. So most of us are pretty familiar with a chronological resume. So that's when we have our contact information, summary of qualifications, and then we insert our um, professional experience using month and year format, right? So that's pretty, pretty, uh, the pretty common resume. But a skills based or a functional resume is an opportunity for you to provide, again, contact information, summary of qualifications, or a professional profile, and then you start to break out in subcategories what skills you have towards a particular role. So I'll go back to cybersecurity as an example. If you're looking at a skills-based resume, maybe your first bullet point is going to be information security and you're going to list um, maybe some certifications, maybe some courses that you've taken around information security, what knowledge you have um, about information security, anything that maybe you've done externally as it relates to cybersecurity or information um, security. And looking at job postings are going to be a great way to see what employers are looking for, to see what skills you could potentially lean into or blend onto your resume. So a skills-based resume is really an opportunity to showcase your skills and your knowledge in different subcategories as it relates to the job posting. And so that's really helpful for anyone that is going to, that is a career switcher or a career predator. So networking as well as using that skills-based resume is going to be helpful. And any additional questions around that, please, by all means, or if you would like to have your resume um, peeked at by an advisor or, or myself, if anyone is happy to assist you, happy to do so, and then we can provide you some content and maybe areas where you can plug and play different um, experiences that will be helpful in targeting that particular industry. Another quick question that came through the chat is, would you recommend linking to your GitHub profile directly in your resume? Yes, I would. So in your contact section where you would put your phone number, email address, maybe your LinkedIn URL, then I would also insert my GitHub um, link so that an employer can see any type of work that you've done that can contribute. Or if you don't want to put it in the contact section, you can create a subsection, um, maybe in skills or additional um, e-portfolio or uh, virtual 
relative related skills, however you want to title that, and then you can put your link there. So then when that recruiter or that employer is, um, they see that link, they can click on it and say, oh, okay, this is great work or this is relevant to the position. So yes, I would definitely encourage you to link any type of experience or exposure you have on your resume um, to a GitHub or ePortfolio. Absolutely, great question. So talk a little bit about networking. Networking should be the foundation of your job search. And in quotations, I always put at your comfort level. Sometimes networking um, can, it can depend on how you feel about entering a room with people you don't know and walking up to them and saying, hi, my name is Lola. I am recently graduating with my healthcare management degree. Um, I am actively um, in the employment market and just curious if you are aware of any positions that may be open. So that may not be the comfort level for everyone or the approach for everyone. But keep in mind, networking is a great way to find, as you see on the third bullet, uncover the hidden job market. So if you prefer maybe not an in-person networking opportunity, perhaps a um, more virtual one, I encourage you to network with recruiters. Does anyone have a LinkedIn profile? And again, just a question for the greater good of the group. Are you utilizing maybe LinkedIn or Handshake? Yes, okay, see some yeses. Wonderful, great, excellent, excellent. This is a great way to send messages to recruiters. Another strategy we talked about in our um, previous uh, drop-in session was recruiters entire position <laughs> is to fill roles for companies. They are paid to recruit. That is their goal. And fill open positions within the organization. And so when you, as a solution provider or job seeker, message a recruiter and say, hi, my name is Lola. I saw your website, saw you had a position for a, again, healthcare management, um, healthcare analyst, um, recently graduated with my degree, also I've completed a SEMA certification, would love an opportunity to, to chat with you about that position and how my experience aligns with it. A recruiter is going to say, Boom, high five, I got someone that is interested, so I don't have to source or go searching, someone actually emailed me and they're interested. So that helps the recruiter to fill that particular position and potentially increase your opportunity for a interview. Or maybe the recruiter may say, you know what, we actually filled that position internally, my apologies, but I do have another position that's either up and coming or we have one at our sister office um, or a remote position that's available. So planning those seeds and messaging recruiters who are going to be your initial point of contact for that, again, either hidden job market or that uncovered job market is going to be a great way. And we do have some resources around sample messaging. I know I just kind of pulled something out the, out the sky here of, of verbiage, but there are some simple uh, ways to message recruiters and inform them, I'm active in a job search, I'm interested in your company, I like what you have to offer. Um, even, you know, sprinkle in a little flavor and say, I check out your website, I saw some of your core values, which align with who I am as a professional. Great way to just um, showcase, you've done your research, interested in a position, I would like an opportunity to talk about my professional experience and how it aligns with this role. All right. That second bullet point, I don't want to um, skip over it, but employers always prefer to interview and hire candidates that they already know. So internal referrals are helpful. That's where networking with that WGU alumni LinkedIn tool is going to be um, helpful. Connecting with employers is, an, is, I'm sorry, recruiters is another one. Maybe the recruiter that you reach out to for Company A doesn't have a position, but sometimes recruiters work in um, consortiums or they have recruiting groups where they talk about best practices and they know of others that maybe are struggling with filling certain positions. And recruiter A may say to recruiter B, I interviewed Lola or I got Lola's resume, didn't have anything for her, but I'm going to pass her one to you. Maybe there's a position that you have for her. So use recruiters to leverage your um, job mm -hmm. search as well. And then that will also help that one, that recruiter fill that position and be able to leverage the experience that you, you possess. There is a thing such as an informational interview, and an informational interview is um, 
when you connect with a subject matter expert and you're trying to acquire information, again, about maybe the current job market, maybe um, you have encountered a hurdle about um, interviewing, you just want to know what questions should I prepare myself for, whatever that, that um, obstacle you may be facing as you are targeting your job search, informational interview is an opportunity for you to connect with someone that's in either a role you're interested in and just ask them um, for a, a quick conversation. Could be three to five minutes or five to ten minutes. Um, it could be conducted via phone, email, video chat, whatever platform works best for you. But come prepared with sample questions to ask about their journey. And so in an informational interview, you want to acquire, you want to not delete it with, I'm seeking a job, I need help, can you help me? You want to ask, I see that you're working in a healthcare management position, or I'll use the cybersecurity example from our chat. I'm work, I'm, uh, see that you're working in a cybersecurity position. Can you tell me what that's like for you? What is your day to day like? Again, are there any certifications that you recommend that maybe your employer is looking for in applicants? Set the stage for that particular individual to provide you with some um, information, but you can address your questions around information that you want to know or that you need to know to help yourself progress in your job search. So it's up 20 to 30 minutes here. I always like to ask small, maybe five to 10 minutes, but then once you ask the right open-ended questions, that 20 to 30 minutes advances really, really quickly. And then this is, again, just some sample verbiage or sample requests um, that you can send to a WGU alumni LinkedIn member. Um, again, I really like the second paragraph. I'm not expecting to discuss a particular employment opportunity, but if that door should open, go ahead and walk through it just in case they say, you know what, I've enjoyed talking with you. You sound like a great candidate for this position that we have open. Is it okay if I send your resume over to the recruiter? By all means, don't don't say no. Say yes. <laughs> Please do. So, but the goal here or the theme here is to not to go into the conversation with this, but if the door should open, go ahead and walk through it. I appreciate being able to talk with you briefly and learn more about your career success um, and industry um, accomplishments. So, just some sample verbiage that can be used. And perhaps you have some apprehension about reaching out. And so here are just some friendly reminders of how reaching out can assist you. You also can utilize um, the Career Professional Development Center and any advisors such as myself to kind of help you take an approach to reaching out. So step one, most people want to talk about their career. Not only do they want to talk about their career and give advice, they want to give back. They want to see others succeed. Someone probably helped them and paying it forward is a real thing. So um, asking for that time to connect, keep that, in, again, if you keep that in mind, it could be definitely helpful in overcoming your job search. Five to 10 minutes isn't a lot of time, 20 to 30 minutes isn't either, but starting small sounds like this isn't gonna take up much of my time, so I'm willing to commit to that, and then if it leans into 30 minutes, then so be it. Um, submitting a few cold requests. So sending in a couple of messages, maybe to some recruiters on LinkedIn or Handshake, um, to a few on the WGU alumni tool. So sending some cold requests, you never know, could yield into a few introductions. So don't send one and say, oh, I didn't hear back, now I'm discouraged. Send a few of them. Um, sometimes five could equal two, sometimes 10 could equal four. You just never know. So send, send a few of those sample requests and see what introductional doors will open for you. And reach back out when applying to an employer. Thank them again for their time. Ask them, are there any other positions that would align with your experience? You may get a referral um, out of that. You just never know. But the answer is always no if you don't ask. So asking and showing appreciation and gratitude for their time can definitely work in your favor. So in summary, as we recap all of this information, to overcome your job search obstacle, number one, tailor or customize your application materials that includes your cover letter, um, any letters of references. You can use those letters of references and infuse keywords from that job posting in them if that is a request of the application submission. So tailor and customize your resume to each position. Use that resource job scan 
or and or request a resume review by an advisor so that we can help you understand which content, where to place it on your resume, which keywords that we see are repeated and that will be helpful. Check your resume format and say goodbye to that template. Again, templates can be complex to applicant tracking systems. And so we would um, discourage you using a template so that an applicant tracking system does not automatically reject a qualified candidate such as yourself just because the ATS is unable to read through complex characters. So ditch that uh, template, but utilize a clean word format to ensure readability and that your resume can be advanced to the next step, the next the, um, section. Conduct a gap analysis. Talk a little bit about that skills gap analysis. Uh, conduct that activity, step one. Look through, the, gather those three to four job postings. Step two, ask yourself rhetorical questions. Do I meet each expectation of this role? Step three is to make sure that you identify any gaps. Maybe you do meet all of them, but if you don't and you um, have some gaps, utilize, then move into step four to see what that gap is, what's the need that the employer is asking for, and utilize any external resources such as LinkedIn, current employer, um, self-taught or self-teaching yourself, or um, how you can utilize maybe any software to apply to your everyday functions. So conduct that skills gap analysis is going to be helpful in overcoming your job search. And then last but not least, reemphasizing networking. Networking by sending sample messages, networking maybe in person, again, if that is your comfort level, networking through informational interviews using that WGU alumni tool. So I will pause here. Any questions for me as it relates to our job conquering job search obstacles. Can we get a copy of the skills gap analysis? Yes, in addition to in this recording, you'll also see that, that exercise as well, but yes, it will come with as an attachment with the recording. Absolutely. All right, perfect. Well, that seems to be the only question in the chat. Just want to click in uh, the chat box, the careers at wgu.edu email address. If you have any questions that you would like to ask outside of this presentation, please let us know. If you would like to connect one-on-one -on -one with an advisor, please let us know. I see a couple of questions coming in at the chat, so I'm not gonna close out until I answer all of them. And one question is, uh, let's see, similar to the question earlier, do you have any recommendations to avoid remaining typecast? Often when I speak to recruiters about opportunities in business as my educational focus, I'm usually followed up with information technology roles instead due to my past experience in the industry. Is there a professional way emphasizing that I'm trying to transition out of IT without completely shutting down the dialogue established with them? I typically end up ghosted when declining their preferred opportunity. Great question. I'd like to chat with you a little bit more about that specifically, maybe specific titles. Um, so I encourage you to send an email to careers at wgu.edu and let's schedule an appointment. But I will provide you with a so solution here. What's mm -hmm. helpful too is if you title your resume, so use a resume with a title about what type of position you're targeting. So for example, uh, I'll use just a recruiter. Um, if you have uh, are targeting a recruiting specialist, where you put your name, so you have, if you can visualize a resume, you have your name, contact information, summary of qualification, or I'm sorry, a title right underneath your name, recruiting specialist, and then a summary of qualifications that align to that title, skills that align to that title. If you're using a skills gap, I'm sorry, a skills-based resume, then you want to use subcategories related to that recruiting title. If you're using a chronological resume and you have some previous experience, then list that there and make sure it relates to that title. So titling your resume is almost like a, a it's almost like a news article. It showcases and it prepares the recruiter of what type of conversation and what type of skill it is that you want to 
use and that you're targeting and striving for. So that's my immediate um, recommendation to you. But again, I invite you to send an email. Let's talk one on one, look at some specifics, and then we can talk through some additional resources that can potentially be helpful for you so that you won't get ghosted or um, have to decline and maybe can pivot the conversation so that it is um, a result, a, a satisfactory result for you. Is career help from WGU only available while we are enrolled? Or if you are an alumni, happy to assist you with some career assistance. So if you book an appointment or if you call and leave a message, an advisor is going to call you back. Or if you book an appointment, you're going to get a call. So we are happy to assist you and answer any questions that you have. And what would you advise for amount of jobs to apply to at once? Tailoring resumes and eat can take some time. Yes, it can. You're exactly right. It is can definitely be time consuming. So I don't have a specific set number that you should apply for. I think you should apply for as many as you can through your comfort level. Now, I have heard some say that they do five a day. Some say they do 10 a day. And I've heard some take that approach because they have crafted a resume where it requires less modification, or maybe they've looked over a study, certain job postings, and they already know where they're going to modify their resume in certain areas. So to answer your question, I don't have a set number for you. I can make recommendations off of what others have done, five to 10 a day, but I encourage you to do what you can on a day-to-day -day basis. But customization, again, it is going to take time, but you'll be surprised that time is going to be a great return on investment if it leads you to from application to interview or application to offer. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I hope I have answered all of your questions. I um, am happy to stay on for about another minute or so. If you um, have additional questions, I encourage you to, again, grab that email address, send your questions over to careers at wgu.edu. If you have questions specifically about the content that I have shared, you are more than welcome to address your question directly to me. I'm happy to answer it for you. Also, keep in mind a couple of things. One, this is one of the many workshops that revolves and rotates each and every month that's presented by our career professional development team. We have others, um, such as our resume workshop. We have um, conquering a career change or overcoming a career change or tips and strategies around a career change. We have networking and LinkedIn. We have interviewing one-on-one. We have cover letters. So the list kind of goes on of different workshops that we offer. So if you register you are, and you find that you're unable to attend, a recording will be sent out to you. But I encourage you to take advantage of the other workshops that are facilitated and conducted monthly, as well as looking over our upcoming career events uh, listing that you can see via handshake that employers that employers are able to, um, that the employers lead, excuse me, got a little tongue tied there, but that employers lead. So that upcoming career event listing provides some information about workshops that we facilitate in the CPD team, as well as ones that employers um, facilitate that has great information as well. So thank you all so much. We also offer, um, just it's, this is a new resource, drop-in hours. So drop-in hours with a live advisor, if you have specific questions, bring your questions all questions are welcome, none are too little, too small. Um, you will see them posted, the drop-in hours and times and days posted on Handshake, same way that you've uncovered this particular workshop. So we invite you to come. Maybe you have a quick question, want to just get it answered, um, then we will be available to provide that response to you as well. So much appreciated, everyone. Thank you so much. Will there be a recording from the Resume Lab from last week? Yes, if it hasn't been sent out already, I will make sure it gets sent out by tomorrow. Yes, definitely will. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Have a great evening. If you're on East Coast like me, it's uh, 10 minutes to 7. If you are Central, it should be 10 minutes to 6. If you are um, Mountain, it should be 10 minutes to 5. And if you are Pacific, 10 minutes to 4. So have a great evening and or remainder of your day wherever you are. I appreciate your time um, with me this evening and take care. See you in our next event.